Our reading today is from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 9. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot, and all the possessions that they had gathered, and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on. By stages to the Negev. I invite the children to come forward. <laughs> How are you guys today? Good. Good. So, in our reading today, we heard about two people named Abram and Sarah, who we often talk about as Abraham and Sarah, so I'm just going to call them that. And God came to them one day and said, Hey, I'm going to bless you. And that sounds pretty great, right? Who doesn't want to be blessed? He says, just take everything that you own and move to where I tell you to move. Does that sound like a good deal? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to pick up everything you have and just go somewhere that you don't know? No. No, that's a little scary. Mm -hmm. Yes. But Abraham said, okay, and did. Because God promised him lots of things. God promised that he would bless them, that he would make their name great, and that they'd have lots and lots of descendants, which are like children. But you know what's strange? They didn't have any kids yet. How old do you think most people are when they have kids? 25. 25? 26. 26? What do you think is maybe too old to have kids? you have an idea? 100. 100. <laughs> For sure. Yes. So at this time, Sarah and Abraham were in their 70s. That's like having grandparents have a baby. And you know what? Sarah didn't have a baby in her 70s or in her 80s, but she did in her 90s. And Abraham was 100 by then. Can you imagine that? Yes. <laughs> I think a lot, a lot of folks who are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, and 100s probably can't imagine it, because that's a lot of work. You guys, you guys are awesome, but you're a lot of work sometimes, right, for your parents? And imagine if they're having a baby for the very first time. So this whole story is about Abraham and Sarah being blessed by God and doing some difficult things in order that the whole world could be blessed. So will you pray with me? Repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God, thank you for blessings, thank you for blessings and for walking with your people. And for walking with your people. Help us today, Help us today to, realize to realize our blessings and to share them with others. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So, two weeks ago, we heard a story how God created human beings. We talked about how God was longing for someone to love, to connect with, and to bless. Pretty quickly, after God created the humans, the humans broke the one rule that God gave them, 
which also broke their original relationship with God. They chose rebellion rather than relationship, which caused all sorts of problems. Their choice to eat the forbidden fruit to become like God was just the beginning of the sins God's early people committed. Adam and Eve's own son ended up killing his brother in a fit of jealousy. And as God's people multiplied, they kept doing things to hurt one another and to hurt their relationship with God. Then last week we heard the story of how God decided to wipe out his sinful creatures and start over with one righteous family, Noah and his family. And by the end of the flood, God regretted that he had decided to wipe out most of humanity and promised to never destroy the whole world through a flood again. And God sealed this promise, this covenant, with the sign, with a rainbow. And that rainbow would always remind God and God's people of that promise and of God's love. I enjoy reading these early stories in the Bible because we can actually read about God starting to figure things out, learning what works and what doesn't work as creation progressed. Giving people free will was great, but it didn't mean that people would make all the right choices. Getting angry at your rebellious people is natural, but wiping most of them out didn't solve the problem of sin. But choosing a righteous person to bless seemed to work pretty well, as well as loving people and making promises to them. So God decided to try more of that. <coughs> so out of nowhere, we're introduced to Abram and Sarai, a lovely couple in their 70s who had no children. Why? Because Sarai was barren, we're told. This is the first of many women we hear about in the Bible who were said to be barren. Yet God calls down to them and makes them some big promises. I'll make of you a great nation, I'll make your name great, and all people will be blessed through you. Awesome. Being chosen by God is super cool, right? But I remember being in seminary in a class when some, several of my classmates had trouble with this passage. It's not right, one of them said. It's not right that God chooses favorites in Genesis. And it's not even that God chooses the best, most righteous people. Sure, Noah was righteous, but Abraham was just some rich guy who God chose to bless even more. And God chose Jacob, the cheat, over his older brother who should have gotten the blessing. And God chose Jacob's son Joseph, who was already daddy's favorite, rather than the other ten sons who weren't so favored. Why? It doesn't seem fair that God should play favorites, choosing one person over the others. And don't get me started on God choosing one people over all the others. Why were the Jewish people chosen rather than the Hittites or Philistines or Canaanites? Shouldn't God love everybody, she said. And the idea is because if one person or one people are chosen, that means others aren't chosen. And while our world is all about playing favorites like election winners, MVPs, beauty queens, and sports champions, it just doesn't seem right that our God would play favorites as well. When I was in high school, I was on the tennis team. And while I had played my whole life with my family, I was not the best on the team. Some were more athletic, and most of the other girls took private lessons year-round, which wasn't an option for me. So I played when I could. I worked hard to get better and just had fun. I wasn't one of the popular girls on the team, so when senior year rolled around and there was a discussion of who was going to be captain of the tennis team, I knew I had no chance. So when the coach suddenly announced me as team captain, everybody was floored, including <laughs> <laughs> but I saw the other senior girls starting to look at one another like, why her? What's he thinking? Then one of the higher ranked girls whispered to another loud enough for all to hear, oh, it's because her dad is friends with the coach. He's picking favorites. At the end of practice that day, coach called me over and said, I heard those girls and, and I'll deal with them. But I wanted you to know, 
I didn't choose you to be captain of this team because I'm friends with your dad. I chose you because you work hard, you lift up others rather than being negative and snotty, and you take responsibility for whatever needs to be done here. That's what a captain does. It's not a popularity contest or an award. It's a role with responsibilities, some of which aren't always fun. And while the other girls wanted the glory of being captain, they wouldn't have done the work the role requires. But I know you will. Being chosen by God wasn't just like being given a major award that you could do with what you liked. It wasn't like winning the lottery where you win riches with no real strings attached after taxes. <laughs> being chosen or called by God might have meant riches or other blessings, but it also came with great responsibility and even burden. While Abraham was promised that he'd be the father of a multitude and eventually have a land of his own, Abraham and Sarah had to move away from everything that they had ever known first. And they wouldn't see either of those things come to fruition. They'd wait another couple decades before having their one son together, and neither of them would see that son have a multitude of descendants. And their descendants wouldn't claim the promised land as their own for hundreds of years. But it's God's third promise that I find most interesting. God promises to bless Abraham and Sarah, which is awesome, right? But God wasn't just choosing and blessing two of his favorite people. He was using them as a conduit to bless the whole world. God says, and through you all nations shall be blessed. In other words, Abraham and Sarah couldn't keep all of the blessings to themselves. God's blessings needed to flow through them, not just to their family or to their people, but to the whole world which is a major responsibility and privilege. So Abraham and Sarah weren't called to be greedy or stingy with God's blessings, but to steward them well and to share them. This important passage highlights what the rest of the Bible ends up teaching us, that people of faith are blessed in order to bless other people. God blesses people so that we can serve those in need and bring abundant blessings upon others. Nobody can only think of just their own needs and blessings. All of us are called to care for one another. And if you think of others who God chose and called in the Bible, you can see this theory playing out. Whether it was Abraham or Moses or King David or the prophet Elijah or the Virgin Mary, God chose each of these people for a purpose. Sure, get, Moses gets a lot of glory, but he was also responsible for a whole nation of former slaves who complained incessantly, while also dealing with God's anger at those people. Elijah had the honor of being God's prophet, but he was hated and hunted by the king and queen that he was sent to bring his message to. Mary had the honor of bearing the Son of God, but imagine the stress and the grief that she went through during Jesus' life. And think of what a difference she made in the lives of so many others. Each of these people were chosen or called to do important things, to be responsible for something that was greater than themselves. And I'm thinking that if normal people could have seen what this chosenness would really look like to these people, they wouldn't have been all that jealous that they weren't called to do the same. But long after Abraham had died, long after Moses had delivered his people from slavery, long after God's chosen people had conquered the promised land, and shortly after the time when God chose Mary, God started expanding the list of chosen people. When God sent Jesus, Jesus chose 12 disciples to help him with his ministry. And after Jesus' death and resurrection, those disciples went all over to tell people about Jesus, and they baptized them. And the Christian community grew from a dozen people to thousands of chosen people, and more and more. Because you see, in baptism, God chooses us all 
as his own children and chooses to bless us with love and forgiveness and eternal life. But that's not all. Being chosen is also a calling that we need to live out. You have been given incredible gifts that are unique and beautiful. And in baptism, God calls you to share those gifts with others, to let God's blessings flow through you to the world. God calls us to be responsible for our neighbors, to serve those in need, to not just keep all of the blessings, but to share and be a blessing to others. My friends, you are chosen. You are called children of God. God has given you gifts for the good of the world. How can we use those gifts and the blessings that you've been given to bring God's grace into all the world? Amen. Our hymn of the day is number 